Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. This is a recording of a webinar that was originally held on November 12, 2014. We had some technical difficulties at this with the sound at that time. So I am Patricia Townsend from Washington State University. I am here today at University of Washington for today's webinar. Our project advanced hardwood biofuels northwest grows hybrid poplar trees as a short rotation energy crop on two to three year rotations, and then does the research and development to turn those trees into bio-based chemicals and also drop in fuels that can be used for transportation. The project is a consortium of industry and university partners throughout the Northwest, led by the University of Washington, the project is broken down into four, five different teams to look at all aspects of converting the poplar trees into fuels. So there's a feedstock team, a conversion team, and then teams that make sure the process is sustainable, and then another team that works on education to make sure we have a workforce to work on this future industry, and then also extension to work with communities and growers. So today we are at University of Washington and we have three of our researchers here that will be discussing the techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment of hybrid poplar-based fuels and chemicals. We have Rick Gustafson, Jordan Crawford, and Eric Budsberg from University of Washington and they will be speaking to you in that order. Well, good afternoon. Before uh, Jordan and Eric talk about the details of the techno-economic work and the life cycle assessment work, I want to give some background on uh, why we're looking at acetic acid and why it's important that we do the techno-economic and the LCA work that you'll see uh, later on. So this sl slide shows the um, trends in the uh, oil prices over the past uh, decade or so. And what you can see here before the recession in 2008, that the price of oil was uh, well over $100 a barrel, pushing $140 a barrel. And then after the recession, it dropped down to in the 50s, and it's been stabilized at about 80 to 90. And then recently, as you may have seen in the news, it's been coming back down and now hovers around $74 a barrel. With these low oil prices and also the huge economies of scale that uh, oil refineries um, have, uh, it's really difficult to produce biofuels, to make drop-in biofuels that can compete economically with, with these, uh, these prices. Nonetheless, we still want to get move the industry forward. And fortunately, there's a route that we can do that. We can build biorefineries, we can make products, and then when the prices of uh, oil uh, change go up, or uh, things like uh, climate change become monetized, then we're ready to build out the biorefineries to provide the uh, uh, fuel products that we, uh, we want to in, in this project. The process that we've been investigating to produce drop-in fuels makes a lot of intermediate products. And Jordan will go over this in, in more detail, but I want to point out that uh, one of the early intermediates produced is acetic acid, and it's produced at a, at a particularly high uh, a volume because the chemical composition of acetic acid and the carbohydrates used to produce it are, are pretty similar. And then if you want to go on to produce a hydrocarbon fuel, you go down the chain, you're reacting it further, and you lose uh, uh, mass or, or volume primarily in, in the form of oxygen, and you have to add hydrogen to the system to finally get to the uh, fuel product. So from a processing point of view and a process economic point of view, as you'll see in a little bit, it makes sense to uh, start with production of acetic acid and then build up the biorefinery to produce the fuels down the road. So the commercial strategy uh, looks something like this. Initially, you build a small biorefinery because capital is a little bit hard to get. 
prove out the front end of the process, converting biomass into acetic acid. Then as time goes on, this could be expanded in both in terms of capacity and product, so you're producing acetic acid and ethanol. And then finally, down the road, uh, depending on how the process economics work out and the, the, um, the demands of society with regard to climate change, you could produce a range of products all the way from acetic acid, ethanol, ethylene, which is used to make uh, plastics, and then that are jet fuel. But before we build any factory producing acetic acid or anything, we really have to see if it's economically viable and environmentally sound. And hence, we've been doing techno-economic work as well as life cycle assessment work to assess both the economic viability and the environmental impact of a buyer finally producing acetic acid. So now Jordan Crawford from University of Washington is going to speak to us about the techno-economic analysis work he's been doing. Okay, thanks uh, Patricia and Rick. And um, let's see, as I go to the next slide here, um, this is just a brief introduction uh, to techno-economic analysis and kind of what this analysis is. Um, first of all, we want to uh, model the conversion process with material and energy inputs and outputs. Um, so this is things like mass flows, um, as well as we keep track of heat uh, and steam going in and out of the system. Uh, and then the economic part of techno-economics is, is uh, economic modeling, which incorporates um, business tools. Um, so we use a discounted cash flow rate of return analysis, also known as an internal rate of return analysis. Um, and we can find minimum selling prices of our products, um, as well as cash operating costs and estimate um, capital costs as well for the biorefinery. Um, on the bottom portion of the screen here, it's kind of a flow diagram of the techno-economic process, and it starts with gathering process information. Um, so all of the process information we use comes from the public domain, so things like literature uh, as well as um, uh, patent information goes into the process modeling. Uh, for the process modeling, we use a software called Aspen Technologies. Um, this gives us uh, quantitative results for the process modeling, again, for those material and energy flows. And then the results of this go to two different areas, the first of which is life cycle assessment work, which Eric will be talking about uh, later in the webinar here. And then the second area uh, that process modeling results go to is the economic modeling. And again, this is capital cost and operating cost estimates. Um, finally, the results of the economic modeling can go to uh, system optimization work being done at UC Davis uh, within the AHV project as well. Uh, a few goals of our techno-economic analysis were first to compare the modeled minimum selling price of a product um, to market pricing. Uh, and so this is done by using our discount cash flow results and then comparing that to um, publicly available uh, kind of market price uh, estimates. The next goal is to uh, estimate operating capital expenses. Uh, and then finally, we want to look at economies of scale, um, so different capacity biorefineries. And then all of this kind of allows us to look at, uh, look at and identify different areas for process improvement uh, within the biorefinery. So what I'm showing here is, again, the process flow diagram, uh, and Rick quickly went over this uh, previously. So this flow diagram goes all the way to a polymer jet fuel from Poplar Feedstock. Um, you can see the intermediate products, uh, yes, the intermediate products here, as well as the um, reaction steps. Um, sugars are a viable commodity. Um, there are ethanol fermenters, uh, the ethanol for the fuel that we use in our cars uh, that will buy these sugars to ferment to ethanol. Um, acetic acid is used in a wide variety of products. Um, ethanol, uh, like I mentioned, is used uh, as a fuel. Um, ethylene is used in plastics. And of course, the polymer fuel um, can be a hydrocarbon uh, jet fuel. 
Uh, there are a couple things here highlighted in red, and that's the lignin and the hydrogen. And these two come, uh, they play a big role within the biorefinery. Um, the lignin can be burned to provide heat, or it can be gasified to produce the hydrogen. Um, but either way, we have to produce enough heat to run the process, and then we have to produce enough hydrogen um, to run our hydrogenation steps as well. Uh, and this hydrogen can come from either natural gas steam reforming uh, or the lignin itself. Uh, this is a quick overview of the economic analysis. So first we estimate capital expenses, and this is largely done using the equation uh, in the top right hand side of the screen. Uh, so we can scale different pieces of equipment based on this equation, um, and we know the scale amounts based on the material or energy flows from Aspen. Um, and then based on literature, we have our initial estimate uh, for, for one size piece of equipment, um, and we can scale that for different size biorefineries. Um, this equation is used for individual pieces of equipment, which are summed up. Um, and then we have uh, additional factors that we uh, include um, for things like construction costs, engineering costs, uh, and all of those go into the capital expense estimates. Next, we estimate operating expenses, which can be broken down into variable costs. Um, this includes things like raw materials, um, as well as uh, excess electricity that can be sold or uh, any co-products that we can sell. Um, and then the second operating expense uh, category is fixed costs, which include things like labor um, and maintenance of the facility. Uh, and finally, we can do a cash flow analysis, and this is a discounted cash flow um, analysis to find a minimum selling price. Uh, so next, what I'm showing here, uh, I have shown before um, in previous years, but this is a summary of the technoeconomic analysis results for jet fuel production. Uh, first, the capital cost on the top half of the screen. Um, we have four different sized biorefineries that we modeled, um, from 25 to 150 million gallons of jet fuel produced per year. There are two scenarios that I'm showing here. Uh, the first is called reforming. Um, and this is where hydrogen is sourced from natural gas. Uh, so we steam reform natural gas to produce all the hydrogen we need uh, to produce the jet fuel. And then the second scenario I'm showing is gasification. And that refers to when we take the lignin and gasify it to produce the hydrogen we need. Uh, on the bottom half of the screen, I show operating cash costs. And this does not include uh, any discount rate. This is just the cash cost required to produce the jet fuel. Um, and again, it's for the two scenarios um, of reforming and gasification, sources for hydrogen. Um, but you can see that the operating cash costs are generally in the range of about $3 to maybe $2.50 uh, per gallon of jet fuel produced. And these numbers uh, compare to kind of the historical market price for jet fuel uh, that I'm showing here. Um, so generally in the last um, few years, around from 2012 to uh, current time, uh, almost 2015, um, jet fuel has been about $3 per gallon. Uh, so going uh, back to the information from the previous slide, at least based on our estimates, there isn't a lot of room for, um, for recuperation of the investment uh, if we produce the jet fuel for $250, for example, um, and sell it for $3, uh, there's just not a lot of room there for recuperation uh, of the investment. Um, of course, market prices do fluctuate a lot, and that um, uh, is just hard to deal with uh, when trying to estimate these, these economic uh, prices. So what we did is we went back to our process flow diagram, and we looked at all these intermediate products that we could produce. Um, again, the sugars, uh, acetic acid, ethanol are all viable, uh, marketable commodities. And what we decided to investigate first here is the acetic acid production. Um, so real quick, uh, just going through these bio-based fuels and chemicals. Um, if, for example, we build a biorefinery that uh, can have an input of uh, 250,000 bone dry tons per year uh, of this poplar biomass. 
uh, we can produce about 145,000 tons per year of acetic acid. Or if the biorefinery was built to produce ethanol, we could produce uh, about 32 million gallons per year of ethanol. Uh, or if the biorefinery was built to produce jet fuel, we could produce about 20 million gallons per year uh, of jet fuel. And this chart shows the potential revenue of these different products. Um, so you can see that the potential for revenue actually increases uh, when we produce only ethanol or only acetic acid as opposed to going all the way to jet fuel. And there are a few factors behind this, um, but one of them is the yield drop as we go from acetic acid to ethanol to jet fuel. So if we focus on only going to acetic acid, uh, and that will be the primary focus for the rest of the webinar here, um, our yields are actually uh, fairly high, but definitely higher than going to uh, ethanol or jet fuel on a mass basis. Uh, so what is acetic acid? It is uh, used in a wide variety of products. I think most people associate it with um, vinegar, um, if they know about it at all. But actually, uh, most of the acetic acid in the world is produced from oil, from uh, petroleum, um, with the exception of vinegar. It's used in uh, acetic acid is used in a wide variety of products. Um, it's used in cellulose acetate, which is a textile, uh, vinyl acetate, uh, and plastics. It's used in paints and adhesives. Um, and you can see that there are uh, just a huge market for acetic acid. Um, it's also used in road de-icing salts uh, as well here in the Pacific Northwest. So this is a quick overview of the acetic acid production process as modeled. Uh, it starts with poplar chips and then goes through uh, pretreatment process uh, as well as an enzymatic hydrolysis process to release sugars from the poplar chips. These sugars are then fermented to acetic acid, uh, but we produce a fairly dilute stream, uh, about 5% acetic acid in water. And the problem here is that we need to purify the acetic acid to greater than 99.8%. Uh, um, so there's a big acid purification step. And what we have uh, spent a lot of time researching here at the University of Washington is how to, uh, the most efficient way to produce a pure acid um, from the dilute acid stream. Uh, and what we have been looking at primarily is a technology called liquid-liquid extraction. Uh, so this uses an organic, uh, so a non-water liquid phase to dissolve the acetic acid out of the water phase. Um, and using this technology, we save a lot of energy. Uh, it uses about 25% of the energy required compared to straight distillation uh, of the 5% uh, acetic acid. This is an overview of the liquid-liquid extraction process using um, ethyl acetate as the organic uh, extracting. Um, so what we have here, first we have an extractor column. And what goes on in this column, uh, the dilute acid stream mixes with a pure ethyl acetate stream. Um, the organic ethyl acetate extracts the acetic acid out of the water phase. And then the organic phase, so the ethyl acetate and the acetic acid go on to the rectification column. Um, in the rectification column, we have glacial acetic acid, which is the pure acetic acid, 99.8%, um, which comes out of the bottom uh, of the rectification column. And we boil off uh, largely the organic phase, which is the ethyl acetate, out of the top of this rectification column. And the third column uh, in the liquid liquid extraction uh, process is the stripping column. And in this, we, we recover our organic phase, the ethyl acetate, from uh, the water. Uh, so this recovery is very important because we need to um, maintain the ethyl acetate in our system. Otherwise, we'd be spending a lot of money buying new ethyl acetate to extract the acetic acid. Um, the effluent here is uh, water um, with a little bit of other uh, components in it. But this goes to a wastewater treatment system where the water can be reused within the conversion process. Uh, this takes me on to our capital cost estimates. Um, what I'm showing here is for a capacity, uh, excuse me, a biorefinery that has a nameplate capacity of 250,000 bone dry tons per year of poplar biomass. 
And we have estimated that the, um, the actual feedstock through glacial acetic acid conversion process um, is about 55% of our total uh, capital cost. And the other 45% here comes from the steam plant as well as the wastewater treatment facility uh, and other supporting utilities. Um, and what we noticed here is that the steam plant and especially uh, the wastewater treatment facilities um, proportionally take up a lot of this estimated capital cost. Uh, and this is an area that we definitely would like to look at further as well as optimize. Um, specifically, one idea we had was that if this facility, the biorefinery, is located near a facility uh, with excess low pressure steam, for example, a uh, pulp mill, um, we could buy the low pressure steam over the fence and we wouldn't have to build our own steam plant, um, saving potentially, in this case, $76 million. Moving on to operating expense estimates, um, these are some assumptions we made going into the cash flow analysis. Um, so a general overview of the discounted cash flow uh, rate of return. Um, this is a um, analysis that's used to compare investments. Um, so we discount future cash flow to year zero, um, which is kind of, uh, year zero is um, uh, just chosen as a, as a base point uh, to discount the cash flow back to. Um, so we use two different discount rates. One of them is uh, the benefit, benefit cost analysis um, perspective. Uh, and this is kind of a social opportunity uh, cost of capital um, discount rate. So that's a 7% discount rate. And then we also uh, estimate the minimum selling price at 15%, which would be more attractive to investors. Some other assumptions that go into the cash flow analysis uh, are that we have a pre-tax stance. Um, we assume there is a 40% equity um, with a 5% uh, loan rate. Um, we assume there is a 20-year uh, project going on here, allowing three years for construction in addition to the 20 years. Um, and then we assume that the feedstock is purchased for $70 per bone dry ton. Uh, so these are the results for our operating uh, expense estimates. Um, you can see they're broken down into feedstock uh, uh, as well as um, natural gas, which are large contributors to the cost. Um, and the reason why we're purchasing natural gas here is to produce this low pressure steam to run the liquid liquid extraction um, process. So we need uh, a lot of steam to run, uh, to run these columns to purify the acetic acid. Um, we also, in producing uh, the steam, uh, run it through a turbine and produce uh, a fair amount of excess electricity that we assume is sold back to the grid, um, in this case at six cents per kilowatt hour. Our, our final kind of bottom line cash production cost is about $375 per ton of acetic acid. And this compares to a market selling price of about $650 to $800 per ton. Um, on the right hand side of the screen, we have our discounted um, minimum selling prices. So at 7%, it's about $670 per ton of acetic acid. And at 15%, we estimate a, about an $850 minimum selling price. We also took the uh, opportunity to look at what if we could displace all the natural gas we purchased with hog fuel. Um, in this scenario, uh, we have done that, and it does not negatively affect uh, the minimum selling prices. Um, in fact, it, it's it's very similar. Um, we assume the hog fuel is purchased for $50 per oven dry ton, um, and our minimum selling prices, uh, the cash production cost is actually about $330 per ton. Uh, with a 7% discount rate, we have a minimum selling price of about $605 per ton, and a 15% discount rate gets us around $775 per ton. So finally, um, we noticed that there were areas for improvement. Um, and this is one of the great uh, takeaways from the techno-economic analysis is that we can model the process. And before anything gets built, we can see areas um, that are proportionally high in cost um, and, and look for ways to reduce these costs. So 
uh, we noticed that the STEAM system, as currently estimated, is expensive. Um, and we believe this has to do with the fact that the boiler is handling solids, um, lignin that gets separated out, as well as potentially hog fuel. Um, and this kind of boiler system um, may just potentially be more expensive than a conventional uh, natural gas boiler. Uh, we also noticed that the waste wastewater treatment system is expensive. Um, and we plan to investigate uh, further um, if this cost can be reduced. Another way to uh, reduce capital costs would be to co-locate the facility next to um, uh, another facility that has excess low pressure steam that they could sell to our biorefinery. Um, we want to investigate further uh, acid separation methods. So uh, there are variations to the liquid-liquid extraction technology that we can investigate. Um, we could run the columns under vacuum and use hot water instead of steam, uh, for example. Um, and there are also other technologies out there. Um, this topo extraction, um, which I'll go to uh, in a little bit of detail in the next couple slides. Um, so what happens here really is that uh, we use small amounts of this topo chemical, which is trioctylphosphine oxide, um, in a organic phase, for example, kerosene. And the topo uh, is a great extractant, so it extracts the acetic acid out of the, the water phase. Um, one potential downside to this is that the topo itself is more expensive than uh, ethyl acetate, but there's huge potentials for energy savings um, in that the acid, which is a small volume, boils out overhead rather than the solvent, which is uh, a large volume. Uh, and this will reduce uh, steam consumption, um, which will reduce our uh, uh, energy requirements for the overall facility. Um, there are uh, patents out there which are over 20 years old uh, for the topo process, um, so it is a commercial uh, viable process. Um, and in fact, there is a mill uh, in Austria which uses the topo process to extract acetic acid and furfural from evaporated dilute uh, liquor condensate. So uh, in the future, um, we'd like to look at uh, continued analysis of acetic acid production. Um, and this includes different liquid-liquid extraction techniques, um, as well as looking into the steam system. And then we'd also want to look at economies of scale for acetic acid production. Uh, we want to look at biorefinery water use, um, so investigate process water usage within the biorefinery uh, and then try to optimize that uh, to reduce water consumption. Um, and an in-depth analysis of wastewater treatment systems um, will let us have a better handle on the capital cost estimate as well as water recycling within the biorefinery. And finally, uh, the techno-economic modeling will continue to support life cycle assessment and system optimization research within the AHB project. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Eric. We'll talk about life cycle assessment work. Hey, I'm Eric Buzzberg, and as Jordan pointed out, I will be talking about the life cycle assessment uh, work we've done. All right, um, so just kind of a quick background. Uh, we've kind of gone over a life cycle assessment before in the past webinar, and I'll refer back to some of that for uh, some of the slides, but just to kind of go over what life cycle assessment is really quick, it's essentially a way to study the environmental impacts of a product or process or, or really anything you want to study, um, but it allows us to kind of get a, an idea of what could happen um, with systems by modeling, modeling them at commercial scale and kind of getting an idea of um, uh, how they could affect the environment. So the way we do that is we first set up our process, and the simplest way to think about this is the creation step, a using step of the product or, or process, um, and finally disposal. So that's essentially a cradle-to-grave analysis there. You're considering everything it takes to make the product, use it, and then get rid of it. And so once you have that, um, it's kind of wrapped up in the system boundaries, which uh, on the slide there would be that blue box there. It kind of encompasses all of the uh, what's known as technosphere flows, or things that we're, um, you could say, man's actually doing. Um, but what we're really interested in is the raw materials that go into, these system, into the system boundaries. So you can think of that as materials coming from the environment, 
and then emissions that are released from this process, which would then cross the, uh, the system boundaries from the technosphere into the environmental impact or, or out into the environment. Um, and so that we want to know what those emissions are so we know um, what potential impacts we could be looking at. And so with that in mind, we're going to move on now to uh, talking about acetic acid production. I'm going to focus only on acetic acid today. I believe Jordan mentioned some stuff about jet fuel. Um, but we talked about, I talked about uh, LCA of uh, jet fuel production in the past webinar, so you can go back to that to get an idea of what that LCA looks like here. Um, and just to kind of go over how acetic acid is currently made, Jordan already touched on this, but there's, there's two ways. It either comes from a petrochemical source, meaning a petroleum-based, um, and in this process it's basically mixing methanol and carbon monoxide with some catalysts and, and other processes going on, but you get acetic acid that way. Uh, the other step is going through a fermentation process. Uh, fermentation process is just uh, basically yeasts or bacteria digesting sugars, and you can uh, get out ethanol from this and then convert that to acetic acid. And uh, the main thing that we're really interested in is the petrochemical route. As you can see, it produces 90, about 90% 90 of the acetic acid um, out there, and that's the acetic acid we would be shooting to replace um, or compete with would be acetic acid used in um, petroleum-based uh, uh, processes, I guess you could say. Um, we're not interested um, or will be making a food grade acetic acid, which is what the fermentation method is used for. And so now to move on to how we're producing it. Uh, Jordan's already kind of gone over the process a little bit here, but I wanted to define what was in our uh, system boundaries here so we know what we're talking about here when we look at the results. Uh, it starts with the poplar chip production, and uh, once again, this was covered in detail in the jet fuel webinar, so you can refer back to that uh, to get a, a good idea if you're really interested in how the poplar chip process, um, production process goes and how we've modeled it. But essentially, it's a coppice harvest cycle where once the trees are planted, we harvest them every, th um, every three years for six years, and these chips uh, are, are then just delivered right to the biorefinery uh, gate. Uh, the, model we have includes direct land use change, site prep, nursery operations, growing operations, harvesting of the trees, and ultimately stump removal. Um, and that stump removal would be after we've gone through six harvest cycles and uh, need to remove the stumps and start the process over again of growing more poplar trees or turning the land over to something else at that point. And this is just a, kind of another overview of the biorefinery system that Jordan talked about in his Aspen model, where we essentially go through a pretreatment process followed by hydrolysis to ferment, and then fermentation. And at, during fermentation, uh, you get the acetic acid, which is our product. Um, and then we also separate out the lignin, which goes to the burner boiler, slash boiler, which provides, um, we end up burning that to get the steam we need to run the process. And this also produces some excess electricity for us. It's uh, considered a byproduct in the LCA. And so for the LCA work, that means that we're just going to avoid production of electricity from another source. Uh, that source is actually going to be natural gas. Um, so we're making the assumption that the excess, elect elect excess electricity the process produces would displace electricity from the marginal grid. Um, and, and in most cases, that's usually natural gas. Um, so the acetic acid goes on and goes through a distillation process, and as Jordan went over, that is quite an energy-intensive step, and you will see the impact of that and the results when we get to that. And uh, once we've gone through that uh, distillation step, we end up with our glacial acetic acid. And uh, I want to... Oh wait, hold on. Um, forgot there's one more step there. Um, also within the system boundaries, there's the ancillary chemicals. Uh, production, and this is chemicals needed to run the process. So that's our process chemicals um, and the enzymes needed for, for hydrolysis. It also includes the natural gas or hog fuel, depending on which scenario we're looking at, to provide, um, to be burned in that burner boiler with the lignin to provide the uh, steam we need to run the process. And so as Jordan's pointed out, we have a large energy demand for that extraction and distillation step. And so that's why we have looked at two different ways to provide this energy, whether we use natural gas or hog fuel. So essentially what we're doing here is looking at providing the energy from a petroleum source or a fossil fuel source, um, which would be the natural gas, versus a bioenergy source, which is what the hog fuel represents. So we did this so we could look at the difference of the environmental um, impacts and to get an idea of, of the range we could possibly expect depending on how we provide that energy. And so all of this here ends the cradle-to-gate 
boundaries. Um, we're going to look at production of acetic acid in two different ways for in our results. And the first is this cradle to gate or cradle to biorefinery gate. So we look at everything on the essentially the front end from the poplar chips up to producing and obtaining that acetic acid. And uh, then we also are going to look at taking that acetic all, um, all the way to its grave, so to speak, or using it, um, using it, essentially disposing of it. Um, uh, we wanted to look at two scenarios here, which would be an immediate release scenario and a long-term storage scenario. So in the immediate release scenarios could be um, something such as if the acetic acid went into a de-icer product, which would be applied to the roads. And then we're assuming that the acetic acid would just decompose um, and be released to the atmosphere as CO2. And the long-term storage would be something if the acetic acid would be used in a product such as plastic, which would have a much longer life. And in this case, we're essentially we're considering the acetic acid and the carbon within that acetic acid to be sequestered. Um, in other words, it's going to be stored in that and stuck in that plastic for a long period of time. And these two, um, this is something we're still working on for modeling right now on how to deal with these end use scenarios. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, depending on the end use scenario you select, it creates a um, quite a range in your your results because you're either releasing that um, the greenhouse gases tied up in that acetic acid product or not releasing them. And so it will have a large effect on the global warming potential and the impact this process could have ultimately have on climate change. And so the, um, that's also why we're looking at the cradle to grave versus, grave versus cradle to gate. Uh, acetic acid is not as straightforward as jet fuel production. In jet fuel production or ethanol production or any biofuel production scenario, you're producing a fuel and you know what that fuel is going to be used for. You're, you're going to combust it in a vehicle um, and so ultimately um, it just provides a, a one endpoint. And, uh, and acetic acid has uh, many possible uses. So we just wanted to come up with kind of a range of results and uh, we're still working on constraining this to come up with the, the best way to handle acetic acid, the end life of acetic acid. So moving into the results here, this is the global warming potential and this is the cradle to biofinery gate. Uh, so this is looking at the, uh, the impact that this process could potentially have on climate change from uh, producing the poplar trees up through uh, obtaining the acetic acid and collecting it at the biorefinery gate. So the global warming potential is measured in kilograms of CO2 equivalents. Uh, this is essentially a way of relating all greenhouse gases to, uh, a, to a CO2, which gives us a, uh, essentially one value to use uh, to, to obtain the global warming potential. And so what we're looking at here is bioacetic acid, uh, bioacetic acid with hog fuel, and petroacetic acid. The bioacetic acid is when we're producing the acetic acid with using uh, natural gas for heating. The bioacetic acid with hog fuel is when we're using that hog fuel to provide the heating and, and the steam that we need for the distillation step. And the petroacetic acid is that uh, uh, the, the way that 90% of uh, acetic acid is currently made, where they uh, essentially take methanol and mix it with uh, carbon dioxide in their process. So you see when we compare these across, um, the, uh, the black bar there is the net emission and the percentage rep represents the percent reduction to petroacetic acid. So you can see in the bioacetic acid case we reduce the global warming potential by 41 percent compared to petroacetic acid. And um, when we use hog fuel we reduce the global warming potential by 340 percent. So that's a significant difference. And the difference between those two models really is the energy source. I mean, that is the only difference between those two models. It's whether or not you're using a bioenergy source to, to uh, provide that heat and steam or if you're using a fossil fuel source to provide that heat and steam. And so that um, ultimately decides how you handle the CO2 emissions and uh, that, that results. Um, with the CO2 result being emitted from using the hog fuel scenario, those are considered biogenic CO2 emissions and don't. Um, immediately or uh, directly contribute to global warming potential because they're part of the carbon cycle. Whereas if we're burning natural gas, uh, you're adding more CO2 to the atmosphere because you're burning a fossil fuel. Uh, and so you can see, um, I'm just going to move on to the next slide, which actually goes over in more detail of the refinery impacts. And the refinery impacts are um, the blue bars on the biocetic acid and biocetic with active hog fuel. And you can see that really dominates our uh, CO2. Uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. And so if we look at those in a little bit more detail, see what's going on at the refinery, you can see when we compare the two here, 
Um, they both uh, have some emissions from their wastewater treatment system. Uh, the natural gas uh, with um, uh, the acetic acid with natural gas heat uh, has a fugitive loss factor um, in, and this is just assuming we would lose some of the natural gas to the atmosphere just through leaks at the plant um, and other uh, just kind of fugitive uh, losses, you could say. And then um, you see that going up to the next one, that both processes have that darker blue bar. That's the lignin combustion. So that's essentially CO2 released when we burn that lignin. And then you see the big difference between the two processes here is whether you have natural gas, which is the green bar in the natural gas heat scenario, or the purple bar, which is hog fuel heat. And uh, the hog fuel scenario releases more CO2, but it's part of the carbon cycle. And so it doesn't uh, impact our results as much. Whereas the natural gas is actually contributing overall to our, our global warming potential. So you can see there's a big difference there when you look at um, what actually is contributing to the CO, um, uh, to our global warming potential from the biorefinery uh, with that natural gas really having a large impact um, on, on the global warming potential from the biorefinery. And so now this is looking at the end use scenarios. So once again, we have that either immediate release or long term storage, and also comparing once again natural gas heating versus hog fuel heating for producing acetic acid. In the immediate release scenario, you can see um, we're looking at a, oh sorry, the units here are tons of CO2 equivalents per hectare of land. So this is just tying it back to the land so we kind of have a, a equal comparison across uh, all the, the two products depending on their end use scenario. And so that you can think of this as how much CO2 would be released um, if we used wood from one hectare of land. Uh, and the, in the immediate release scenario, it kind of uh, reflects what we have seen uh, in the previous slide, where the natural gas heating would release more CO2 per hectare of land um, versus the hog fuel heating, which would uh, re re uh, or emit less uh, CO2 or CO2 equivalents per hectare of land. And that's once again because the hog fuel heating scenario uses a bioenergy source. Uh, and then we look at long term storage here, you see a large difference. And, uh, the hog fuel, uh, or the natural gas scenario, once again, is emitting some CO2. We're, we're burning that natural gas to uh, produce our acetic acid, and then that, um, and so that you're you're actually releasing some uh, CO2 in greenhouse gases to the environment. In the hog fuel heating scenario, we actually have a reduction. We're actually sequestering CO2 uh, from the atmosphere per um, and quite a bit per hectare of land, and that's because. Uh, you're using bioenergy to make a product that essentially is trapping carbon into a chemical. And so you get a large credit for that, a pretty big benefit for it. And so uh, kind of just uh, the, the results here aren't finalized by any means. We're still working on this uh, analysis and how to deal with the end use scenario. But we wanted to show it because it does give a potential to look, consider the range we could be looking at here for our uh, global warming potential of producing bioacetic acid and what it can mean for um, for the biorefiner uh, bio industry as well as uh, considering what your final product goes into uh, if you when you go to long-term storage process we can actually uh, maybe actually sequester some greenhouse gases specifically co2 from the atmosphere and store them in some long-term products uh, but that's something that in especially in the LCA world in general is a uh, ongoing investigation right now on how to to really deal with this and model this. So there is a lot of uncertainty in these results still. But to give you an idea of just the potential uh, for making biocetic acid. And lastly, this is comparing it's producing acetic acid uh, to producing ethanol and jet fuel, all from the same uh, plant or biorefinery. To, um, and so this is looking at the global warming potential savings. So essentially this is saying if we were to use these biochemicals or biofuels in place of a petroleum-based chemical or petroleum-based fuel, what would be the amount of uh, global warming potential savings or how much greenhouse gas could we uh, save from being emitted to the atmosphere? And so when we look at it this way, um, this is just going to the immediate release scenario and we're comparing the, the immediate release scenario of acetic acid with ethanol and jet fuel because it allows us to compare across a uh, level playing ground, so to speak. Um, because in the jet fuel and ethanol scenarios, you'd also have an immediate release of uh, the carbon uh, 
contain in those fuels when you combust them. So you can see here that acetic acid and ethanol are very close to having the same global warming potential savings. Uh, in all reality, we consider these two to be the same. The amount of uncertainty that is still in the LCA results um, is enough to, uh, it's, it's it, at least 5% plus or minus, and these results here are within 5%. Um, so the acetic acid and ethanol are about the same, and uh, it, they both look better than producing jet fuel. When you go to jet fuel, you're producing a larger, uh, larger hydrocarbon fuel, and so it takes more energy input, um, which ultimately means uh, more fossil fuel input to produce that jet fuel. And you're also decreased, you also have a lower yield of jet fuel than if you were to make uh, ethanol or acetic acid. Uh, so overall, acetic acid looks really good from a global warming potential standpoint, um, even when we compare it to other fuels we've already looked at at the biorefinery. So in conclusion, bioacetic acid has a global warming potential that's lower than petroacetic acid. Uh, our work finds that the distillation process has a large energy demand, and this is a significant source of greenhouse gases in the LCA analysis. Um, if we do use hog fuel energy, we can reduce, uh, greatly, actually greatly reduce the global warming potential. Um, and so uh, this is something for us to look into to see if it's uh, ultimately feasible, which we think it is at this point. And, uh, see if we can reduce our global warming potential even more for producing acetic acid. Uh, using acetic acid or producing most biochemicals, at least uh, biochemicals that can be used in plastic production, uh, presents potential for a long-term carbon storage. This is something that has uh, some uncertainty associated with it, not only in our work, but just in the LCA world in general, and it's something that we're continuing to do research on. Um, but that's one of the things we'll be looking at in the future here, is how to better constrain that. Um, and what the acetic acid uh, end use scenario you choose has a large impact on the global potential as well. So we want to think about what uh, products it could be potentially going into as it has a large uh, swing in the global warming potential, um, being that whether it's immediate release or if it goes into that long-term carbon storage. Um, but ultimately, it, uh, producing bioacetic acid achieves an absolute global warming potential savings similar to ethanol and greater than biojet fuel. So it presents an uh, attractive option uh, not only from the uh, environmental standpoint, as you just saw, but also from the economic standpoint, as Jordan said, of getting these biorefineries up and running. And uh, we, so we, just to kind of wrap this all up, uh, we've been looking at producing bioacetic acid um, and considering biochemicals in general as we move forward here because producing hydrocarbon biofuels is proving to be challenging. Um, there's uh, some economic hurdles that must be overcome to get the, uh, get the biofuels uh, industry moving forward, especially in regards to producing hydrocarbon fuels. And so one way, we were, as we've pointed out, is uh, to get these fuels moving forward is to consider producing a higher value product from a cheaper biofinery design. And that can get us up and running. And bioacetic acid presents an attractive option. It meets both of these goals in that uh, it is a higher value product. Um, we can compete with uh, petro petroleum-based acetic acid on an economic standpoint. And it has a better environment, or at least glo better global warming potential. Um, compared to petroacetic acid, and uh, let's see, and um, ultimately producing uh, acetic acid will diversify the biochemical product line of the biorefinery, um, so we can ultimately make more uh, fuels and biochemicals as we move towards the future of these biorefineries. So I'd just like to finish up by thanking the USDA for funding the research. And we do here, and um, also everybody who works on the Advanced Hardware Biofuels Northwest project for all the great research they've been doing and uh, working on. It's been really fun to see many points of this project be uh, looked at and to kind of get an idea of everything that needs to be considered if we were actually to get a biofuels in industry moving forward. And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank our private industry partners, Yakem and Greenwood Resources. They've been really helpful with providing information for us for developing the uh, economic reports and LCA reports to get an idea of how things are actually being, being done in the private sector. So it really helps contribute to uh, the, the results we're getting. Um, we feel like they're becoming more and more representative of uh, what we can expect to see happen with the biofuels industry moving forward. And uh, lastly, I thank the University of Washington and uh, the Extension Office for putting together this webinar. 
So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Eric. We have another webinar coming up in January of 2014. 2015, actually. <laughs> it's on January 14th. And it will be with uh, Brian Stanton from Greenwood Resources, as well as David Neal from Davis. And they will be discussing using molecular tools and poplar hybridization for bioenergy. So thank you for attending this webinar. And we look forward to seeing you at webinars in the future. Have a good day.